Here we are at my um, apple seedling trial rows. These are all apples that I intentionally crossed between two parents. So I took the pollen of one parent that I liked and crossed it with another parent that I liked. And they've been growing here for, I don't know what, maybe this is like their fifth or sixth year. Anyway, I'm starting to get some fruit and about 12 varieties bloomed this year and about maybe six or seven of those produced fruit. And it looks like I'm gonna get to taste about four to five significant um, significantly interesting apples. Each tree in this block has one of these tags that's a unique identifier. This means that I crossed grenadine apple with golden russet in 2011, and this is number 12 is just a unique identifier number for this cultivar. It doesn't mean it really mean anything. But that's the number that allows me to distinguish this from the next tree, which is the same except it's 1111. You always put the seed parent first. So this means that I pollinated a grenadine blossom with golden russet pollen. So let me tell you about these um, parent apples for a second. Golden russet is a russet apple. It's probably the greatest American russet. Um, culturally, it's not perfect, but flavor-wise, it's amazing and it has extremely high sugar levels. So I'm interested in golden russet for the flavor and the sugar. Grenadine is a red fleshed apple. It ripens in late November into December. It has, um, when it's very ripe, it has a dark red or, or at least very dark pink flesh. It has a lot of problems. It tends to be low in sugar. It's kind of acidic. It's kind of harsh. It has a lot of tannins. It goes mealy when it's ripe, but between the red flesh and it has these great aromatic berry-like flavors, you know, kind of like fruit punch type flavors. And that's really what I'm after is the red flesh and the fruit, fruit punch type flavors. So tons of these trees in, in my blocks are pollinated with grenadine because of that. Um, I've expanded since and I use more different red flesh parents, but most of the first two years were grenadine crosses. All right, so here we go. Um, I have this little nylon bag. This is called a foot sock. It's just something people put on their feet when they're trying on shoes at the shoe store so they don't contaminate the shoes or get some kind of weird shoe disease. Okay, so why am I picking this now? Um, I already ate one. It seemed not quite ripe, but it was still good to eat. And that was a couple of weeks ago. Judging any apple for ripeness is kind of like this learning curve. I mean, every variety is different and there's things you can look for, but a lot of times you just don't know until you bite into the thing. So the reason I'm picking this one, it's developed a significant amount of apple aroma. That's often an indicator that an apple is ripe or ripening. It can also mean that it's overripe. So it's not set in stone. It's not a reliable indicator, but it's at least something to go on. Now I only have two of these left. The other ones either fell off or were damaged and I you know, tasted them early. There weren't very many. I'm guessing there'll be more next year. Those bumps on there are scab and that's a fungal disease and you can see that one is kind of cracked and that could make them ripen a little bit early too. So what we're going to do today is pick this apple, stick it in the fridge, and then maybe this evening or tomorrow or the next day sometime soon we'll uh, taste it and see what it tastes like. It's kind of hanging on tenaciously. Let me smell it again. Oh yeah. Okay, here we go. It's not an unattractive apple. It has a smooth, waxy skin. It's kind of angular, which is actually a grenadine trait, except that grenadine will usually have one very prominent rib, kind of like this, but more prominent, almost like this kind of nose, uh, Roman nose effect or something. Weight, kind of average, doesn't feel particularly dense or particularly light. All right. It's several days later and it's time to taste our apple. I've been saving this in the fridge for days. Hopefully it hasn't absorbed a lot of refrigerator taste. Um, some apples I've found will re absorb refrigerator taste. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like just all the weird flavor of the refrigerator and it gets in your food and it tastes bad. Some apples won't absorb it. Um, even after, I've had apples sit for months in like the crisper drawer with like, you know, all kinds of funk going on in the refrigerator and they're totally fine. Anyway, some apples will absorb it just like almost immediately. So here's our apple. It has an extremely smooth skin. It takes a high polish, uh, waxy feel. It has almost, really you can't see the lenticels, the little um, spots that you see on some apples and they're like little breathing apparatus or something like that. I don't really understand it, but something like that. 
you can't really see those at all. It's just smooth. There's a little bit of red blush. If this had more sun, it'd have a red blush on this whole side right here uh, on the sun side. And by the way, that spot is usually the most flavorful and sugary part. There's actually a poem that talks about that, but if you go around and um, taste that, that's the best part of any apple usually. So yeah, let's take a taste. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's quite sweet. It's not quite ripe. It's, it tastes very sweet and it's not ripe. Okay, so I'm surprised that it, this is not ripe. Um, actually, because it has so much scent, but I can see that there's quite a bit of green here. So some things about this apple. It is a fairly high astringency. Um, astringency comes from tannin, uh, the same stuff we use to tan hides, the same thing that makes your tea a little bit bitter um, and puckery. And tannins are good. In a dessert apple, you need tannins. Uh, a dessert apple without tannin is not a good dessert apple. Um, you don't want too much though. When you start to get too much, you get into like cider apples. You know, this is pretty good actually. Um, you start to get into cider apples because uh, cider, uh, in cider, tannin is one of the things that really gives you um, body and, and flavor to the cider. Very important in cider and in dessert apples, but you know, it's a matter of levels. Now, one of the parents of this is grenadine, and grenadine is a pretty astringent apple. Um, early in the season, it's downright harsh, and then later it mellows out, but you know, it always has a pretty good degree of astringency, like to the point where it would probably bother some people to uh, just eat it. One thing I wanna say uh, about this entire project is that most of the trees that are planted right now have one red-fleshed parent, and those red-fleshed apples that I use have a lot of primitive genes. They aren't the best apples. I mean, that's part of the reason I'm working with them. Let's say if I took two of my like top shelf, like top 10 dessert apples and started crossing amongst top 10 dessert apples, say, let's, let's say I did that. You would expect that my results would be better than if I took a, a somewhat more undeveloped and primitive apple, which in this case is apples that were being worked on by Albert Etter, most of which were not actually released by him ever. They were just works in progress. I mean, he knew they need, needed to be improved. So you'd expect that, you know, my results would be better if I'm crossing high quality dessert apples versus I'm taking, what I'm doing is this is golden russet crossed with grenadine. Now golden russet is outstanding. And that I crossed with grenadine, which is this kind of harsh, low sugar, high tannin, goes mealy um, by the time it's ripe you're like, why did you use that? Why did you use that? Um, well, the red flesh, but what comes with the red flesh, it has like a fruit punch type of flavor. That's what I'm after is that fruit punch flavor and the red flesh. So that's why I used it. So let's get back to this for a minute. So this is crisp. You hear it? Very sweet. It looks like it has, it has some brown spots in here that look almost like water core, but Kind of like bruised water core, so I don't know what that is about. It's fully edible for sure, even though it's not ripe. It's pretty astringent. I might give some people pause. I actually kind of like it. Flavor wise, it doesn't have the fruit punch flavor because it doesn't have the red pigment, and the red pigment is probably what actually tastes you know, usually the more red the apple is, the more it has those flavors, and it doesn't have the brilliant, deep. Um, intriguing, compelling symphony of flavors of a good golden russet, but it also isn't ripe yet. Well, it's not wowing me or anything like that. But the main the main point to me with this apple right now, I mean, I'm gonna have a lot of these. I probably have 120-ish apples in the ground and maybe close to that many that are supposed to grow in the ground this year. And I don't know how I'm gonna make that happen. Um, I may have to do some kind of crowdfunding campaign to hire labor or something like that. We'll see about that. And buy rootstock, I have to buy rootstock. You might have a lot of these. So it's not like I'm, I'm gonna, every time I have an apple ripening, I'm gonna pick it and make a video about tasting every single one of those apples. I might do some of them in batches and stuff like that, but eventually I'll just be kind of sampling and saying, oh, that one's no good. I'll make notes and all that. And occasionally I'll, I'll talk about one. One of the main points I wanna make is, you know, this isn't a spitter. This is perfectly edible. It's extremely sweet. 
It has a great texture. I could say, you know, the flavor is not compelling, but it's an, it's no slouch. I mean, it has plenty of flavor. It's uh, quite good. I'm definitely going to finish it. Kind of the main point or point of interest I want to bring up with this apple. I mean, it's not, there's nothing about it that is remarkable. You know, I'm not seeing anything where I'm going like, wow, this is amazing. But it's probably not going to be that exciting. Really good chance it will never get propagated at all. Like I may just cut the tree down and throw it away. But it is not a spitter, you know, which means that it's an apple you take a bite out of and you're like, eh, spit, you know, either for, for whatever reason. Often because it's going to be like bitter and sour and low in sugar. So if you read Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire, there's uh, four chapters and one of them is on apples. Um, pretty much it seems to me like the whole fabric of that chapter is woven around the idea that you cannot grow an apple from seed without getting something terrible or that your chances are like, you know, one in thousands or even more that you're going to get anything good. And I'm not talking about something that you can market, I'm talking about something you can even stand to eat. Um, or, you know, maybe you could squish it for cider, but you're not going to be able to eat it. And that has just seeped into the public consciousness so thoroughly that um, that's what people think now. And it's not true. Um, you know, this is the second apple I've showed you guys that's perfectly edible that was grown from seed. The first one was an open pollinated seedling, meaning I don't know what the other parent was. It was just like a Wixen seedling that I grew. This one is a cross between two parents. And we'll see how the rest of these shape up, you know, but, you know, I've given you guys other examples in other videos, like my friend Freddie, who says that, you know, more of the apples that he grows from seed are worth eating than not. And this guy's like an apple snob. So he's not saying that they're, the rest of them are inedible. He's just saying that half of them are actually worth like, like continuing to eat basically is how I understand it. So yeah, uh, that's the main point I want to make. And I just want to bust this myth up like, in the worst way because um, I just find that it's it's hindering our progress and what I really want to see is the return to the chaos of apple breeding that that really like created American apple diversity in the first place um, I don't mean apple breeding but just growing stuff from seed and you know Poland talks about that quite a bit in his book and it's probably more on base on that stuff but you know people would plant seeds and they would plant seedlings and graft onto them and then those would escape and grow over and fruit and then like you know there were just stuff in in um hedgerows but people planted a lot of seedlings too there's blue jays over here eating eating my grapes and yelling at me at the same time so uh yeah what was i saying sorry i'm kind of tired and <clears throat> dirty i've been working on tires all day well, it's the tires yeah. I'm just kind of like talking here, but <clears throat> not not really what I usually do. But I can't reshoot this because I only have one of these, right? So anyway, my point is it's not a spitter. I think as this ripens up, it's actually going to be better. It's worth eating right now. Um, and we'll see how the rest of mine go. I probably, we're probably going to get to taste, you know, four or five, maybe even six different new seedlings this year. And I'm hoping next year for like a real real big crop of uh, new stuff to check out and then from there on it'll just increase for a while uh, probably four or five years uh, and even if I stop right now which I may have to do at some point because it's just getting out of, it's just gonna get out of hand like I can only afford to do this so much and really my purpose is you know I, I really want to breed some apples and I want to succeed and all that but honestly the part that is more interesting to me is the information and inspiring other people to do it like if i can only grow so many here on my little homestead if i you know eventually influence a whole bunch of other people to do it and they influence other people and we can get back to this idea of growing apples from seed and taking a few risks you know and not being like terrified oh my god I'm, if i plant an apple seed it's going to be this sour green thing that the kids can throw at each other and that's about it but that ain't the case okay um i mean obviously depends on what you plant what the parents were but you're going to see as my apples start to ripen that they're going to be mostly edible and not mostly spitters and i don't know how to correct the misinformation propagated by that one you know book chapter but i guess this is my way of starting that process yeah i'm gonna finish this i think it's gonna be extremely sweet because golden russet has a very high sugar content. I think it's like 18% or something crazy like that. That's extremely high. Yeah, but it's actually pretty far from ripe. This brown too could be from like a nutrient deficiency. 
the conditions these things are growing under is just harsh. They're, they're planted one foot apart. They're extremely close together. Um, so they're competing heavily and they don't get enough water. They don't get enough food. Like I need to buy some fertilizer and stuff like that. So we're going to see what we can do to buy some fertilizer and maybe hire some labor and kind of spruce up this project a little bit because I'm, I'm just barely keeping it together with the, the whole project. I feel pretty pensive about pulling off getting the seedlings that I have growing this year grafted and planted out because it's going to be like as much as I already have in I think um, again and that I put in over three years you know three different years so yeah pretty big project. I'm pretty intrigued by this apple actually we'll see how it develops I'm going to um, look at the tag get the number and I'm going to write that down in my notes and make you know specific notes on this apple and we'll see that way I'll have something to compare to next year because obviously my memory is not good enough to remember the numbers on 120 tags and what the apples tasted like. I kind of wish I had another one. Chickens get the rest. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 